Welcome. My name is Liliana Rojas Suarez, and I'm the director of the Latin American Initiative at the Center for Global Development. Uh, today, I'm delighted to host a conversation on a long standing issue in Latin America capital flow volatility. Uh, in the context of low domestic sources of finance, including very low savings ratios and tax collection, the region has certainly benefited from external financing. But these flows have also entailed risks that some countries in the region have not always managed well. Today, we'll take a fresh look at the pattern of capital flows, old and new risk associated with them, and an assessment of policy responses, including during COVID-19 and looking for forward on its aftermath. To motivate this discussion, we have a great report produced by the working group formed by the Committee on the, finance, on the Global Financial System and published by the BIS, which is, of course, the Bank for International Settlements. And we have the pleasure to have the two co-chairs of the report with us today. Gerardo Garcia Lopez from the Central Bank of Mexico and Livio Straca from the European Central Bank. Uh, Livio, who is currently the Deputy uh, Director General of International and European Relations at the ECB, will present briefly the results from the report, uh, which is appropriately entitled Changing Patterns of Capital Flows. Following Livio's presentation, we have a very distinguished panel that will join in the discussion. In alphabetical order, Laura Alfaro, the Warren Albert Professor from the Harvard School, former Minister of National Planning and Economic Policy in Costa Rica. Gerardo Garcia Lopez, as I just mentioned, the report co-chair, who is the Director General of Central Banking Operations at the Bank of Mexico. Jose de Gregorio, Dean of the School of Economics and Business from the Universidad of Chile, former governor of the Central Bank of Chile. And Luis Oganes, Head of Currencies, Commodities and Emerging Markets Research from JP Morgan. So we basically have a great representation from policymakers, former policymakers, ex experts, academia, and the market. So really, we're looking to a great discussion. Time permitting, uh, we could have time for a question from our audience. Uh, you have the information about uh, how to connect, but just to repeat, you can email at events at cgdep.org, or you can tweet at cgdep and using the hashtag cgdeptalks. Without further ado, since we don't have too much time and too much to discuss, uh, please go ahead, Livio. So uh, thank you, thank you, Liliana, and uh, and thanks uh, for for the invite to this, uh, this great panel, this great event. Uh, now I'm going to share my slides. So I'm hoping you see the slides now. Yes, we do. Super. Um, so this is, um, um, as Diana already mentioned, a report prepared by the Committee on the Global Financial System, um, which uh, I co-share with Gerardo, is also part of the panel, uh, and uh, is a result of, um, you know, of a big um, effort, uh, including many central banks, uh, so it's a large report. Uh, so I, I, I would like to encourage you to to, to read it because I, I will not do justice uh, to it in in ten minutes. Uh, and there is also a shorter version published in Box EU. So if you want to have a bit of a kind of summary, that, that could be a you know good way. Uh, the the report builds on several pieces of of work. Uh, there was a survey of central banks. Um, there was a, an extensive literature review. I mean the literature on capital flows is enormous. So we had to, uh, you know, to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, we present new evidence, um, and also uh, there were two roundtables with um, uh, key academics and also market participants. So all this has has been reflected in this uh, in this report. Um, so let me uh, just mention, uh, you know, what the structure of the report is. Um, so there are there are basically four chapters. 
so the first chapter uh, talks about the trends, uh, in particular since the global financial crisis and what has happened to capital flows since uh, 2009. Uh, the second chapter is about the drivers of, uh, of gross uh, inflows and, and outflows and also sudden stops. So sudden stops are, are, are periods of, of, of strong contraction in flows. Um, and, and in particular, what has changed uh, before and after uh, the um, uh, global financial crisis. Um, chapter three uh, looks at the benefits and risks of, uh, of flows, uh, in particular of, of free, free flows or, or large flows. Uh, and, and chapter four uh, is about what countries, what policymakers can do to address volatility in, in flows uh, and also what, the less, what lessons can be learned from, uh, in particular, the COVID-19 episodes. So we, we saw a, long, uh, you know, a large contraction in flows, you know, what we can learn, we can learn from, from this crisis and other previous crisis um, episodes. So let me uh, uh, go quickly to the key findings of the first three chapters. Um, so in terms of trends, uh, what we uh, kind of um, document uh, is, is a declining uh, amount of flows to advanced economies. Uh, but flows to EMEs have uh, held up better. So in particular, China has received a lot of flows since the global financial crisis. An important trend has been the shift from banks to non-banks. So market finance, so non-bank intermediaries have become important, more important uh, as a driver of flows. Uh, there was more local currency issuance by uh, sovereigns in EMEs, uh, but overall uh, the US dollar remains dominant. Uh, corporates, so EME corporates still uh, issue US dollar and they have issued a lot. So, uh, so this uh, more than compensates uh, the increased local currency share of, of sovereigns. Uh, and finally, FDIs uh, have uh, uh, um, shown uh, a less stable nature and they uh, tend to reflect more um, uh, the action of multinational enterprises uh, for, for various reasons, but many of, many of those are uh, is it represents sheets of funds across jurisdictions for, for regulatory or, or, or tax avoidance, uh, avoidance uh, reasons. Um, in terms of the drivers of flows, uh, what we find is that um, you know, sudden stops, so the, again, this uh, sharp contraction in flows, have not increased in frequency since the crisis. So unlike what is sometimes uh, taught or, or, or mentioned, um, but in terms of, uh, so if anything, the, the, the frequency has declined. Uh, but what, is, what has been notable uh, is that um, what I would call global liquidity, which you can associate also to US monetary policy, but not necessarily only that, um, it has become an important driver uh, of, of, of these episodes. Uh, while risk aversion um, remains important for regular volatility flows, so for the day-to-day -day or a month-to-month -month variation, but we find less evidence that it matters uh, uh, after the crisis for, for sharp reversals in flows. Um, what we also find is that DMEs kind of graduated. Uh, so the, um, what we find is um, these terror institutions, the quality of institutions, uh, you know, while remaining important as, as, as declined in importance uh, and the seagull conditions have become more important over time. So, so in a sense, they, uh, uh, you know, they tend to behave a little bit more like advanced economies, even though probably this kind of graduation process is not complete, is not full. Uh, in terms of the balance of benefits and risks, um, you know, the, the report reemphasizes the, uh, the benefits of, of flows. So we had, um, I mean, I, I didn't mention that there was a, a similar report by the same committee in 2009. So this report represents a bit of an update of that, uh, of that report. Uh, and, and one key difference compared with 2009 is that we now find uh, much uh, clearer evidence of the benefits. Uh, but this, of course, is not um, excluded that also risks uh, exist or continue to exist. Um, and, and, and I mean, there are, some of the risks are, are, are traditional, but one, probably if you want one key new finding of the report, is that even um, local currency debt, which is typically taught as the more stable type of debt, uh, as an element of fragility because foreign purchases are more fragile, more volatile for uh, local currency debt. So, so, so issuing local currency does not fully protect emerging economies from uh, volatility in uh, 
global financing conditions and inflows. Uh, so in spite of, of uh, uh, all the fact that uh, it, they, they, they appear um, uh, you know, less relevant cross-section, we still find that equity institutions is key to attract higher quality flows. And here, I don't mean only uh, you know, preventing sudden stops, but is also uh, to attract flows that lead to um, uh, increasing productive capacity, increasing productivity, increasing TFP. So if you want these high quality, stable and productivity enhancing flows, uh, uh, the evidence is that the quality of institutions uh, still matters for, for, uh, for those. And, 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 and in the quality institutions, I also include uh, the, um, the state of the financial sector. So this, if you have um, a well-capitalized and well-regulated financial sector, it's more likely that the type of flows uh, that the country receives are more of the high quality type. Um, in terms of policy issues and lessons, um, so um, basically one, one, one key element which we discuss in the report uh, is that uh, policymakers need to address several trade-offs uh, using their policy tools. So they have to um, you know, try to attract high quality flows so that they want to avoid the flighty flows or the flows that um, imply a capital misallocation towards uh, less productive sectors. Um, so they, they have this kind of long-term issue of attracting high quality flows, but they also have to deal with shorter term issues, uh, you know, managing the volatility in credit and asset prices that flows imply in many countries. And also they have to, um, once the crisis happens, they have to respond to the crisis. So they have to uh, break the link between, uh, you know, global financing conditions and local financing conditions, so in, in, especially in a crisis uh, situation. So the, so the uh, countries are heterogeneous. They have to manage multiple trade-offs. Um, so so the, 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 the general kind of lesson uh, of the report is that there is no one size fits all prescription. If you want, there is no um, uh, easy, uh, easy um, lesson or easy prescription that can be given to any country. Uh, local conditions differ and, and they matter a lot in terms of designing the optimal uh, policy. Um, when one, one general lesson that we also uh, draw uh, from the literature is that uh, even ex post policies that address vulnerabilities, I mean, think of uh, 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 changing financial reserves or, or, or capital controls and so forth. So these may be useful, so we should not, they should not be taboo. But at the same time, they are not a substitute for, for longer term adjustments. So there is a, uh, you know, there is a, we still believe there is some, uh, some hierarchy of tools and, uh, and, you know, macroeconomic, good macroeconomic policies uh, are, are still are, are the most important element uh, in, um, you know, in dealing with volatile flows. Uh, and then a third key lesson is that international cooperation remains key. I mean, partly is uh, uh, this is a reflection of the increased um, kind of market finance nature of flows. Uh, so these flows uh, are, are, are more and more driven by push factors. Uh, they are driven by, um, you know, large uh, financial intermediaries, uh, global, global intermediaries. Uh, and, and this naturally, you know, they become, it becomes an, you know, an, a, lo a global phenomenon, but also the policies that countries implement to counter uh, capital flow volatility also can have spillovers. You know, think of uh, capital controls. So it's well documented. They have, they can have spillovers for their countries. Uh, so, so also in that area, uh, it's important not to conduct a, a beggar the neighbor uh, policy, um, uh, or, or I mean, beggar the neighbor in a sense of deflecting capital flow volatility. So there are, a, a, you know, multiple, a multiple dimension of uh, of um, interrelations that really uh, uh, showcases the need of, of international uh, cooperation. Um, and, and I wanted to conclude my presentation by um, kind of describing uh, a bit uh, the COVID-19 shock. Uh, so as you know, the COVID-19 shock was very sharp. So led to a very strong contraction in flows uh, at the peak of the, of the crisis in March, 2020. But at the same time, it also, was also very short lived. So what we find at the time of the shock is, uh, is that we, we, we find a spike in global risk aversion. You remember the, the VIX was uh, above 80 in March 2020. Uh, we, 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 we see the, the role of pull factors in the sense that countries with weaker fundamentals were more affected. 
um, we, we also find uh, you know, a key role of market finance. So, so we find that non-bank financial intermediaries displayed uh, a procedural behavior. Uh, this led to contagious outflows and volatility. And, and we also find that in the tracking also uh, mattered in, in, in driving outflows. Um, then we, we observed also, in, you know, basically in the same month, uh, um, a very strong policy reaction by advanced economies, by also by emerging economies. So emerging economies, they, 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 uh, this is interesting, they acted very much like advanced economies. They, they adjusted monetary policy. Um, one, I mean, one, one notable exception of compared with previous crises has, has been the relative lack of capital controls or, or use of capital controls during this crisis. So it was more like, uh, so the emerging markets behave much more like advanced economies. Uh, and also, you know, what I would call the GFSN, so the Global Financial Safety Net, uh, played an important role. The existence of swap lines, repo facilities by major central banks, uh, and also the IMF programs were, were accessed by, by several um, developing countries. Uh, so, I mean, and I think nobody is really has, a, a, you know, a kind of a, a decomposition of the role of these factors in eventually making the crisis short-lived. Um, you know, I, I, I still have to see an analysis doing that, um, but, but I would say a combination of stronger fundamentals in emerging markets, more mature policy response, and aggressive monetary policy reaction in advanced economies, uh, uh, this, this combination, uh, you know, worked in making this, uh, this, uh, this episode short-lived and led to a, a turnaround. So I think with that, um, you know, I, I stop my, uh, my presentation. I look forward to the discussion by the panel. Thank you. I, I can't hear you, Johanna. Yeah, Sorry, I forgot to uh, unmute. Uh, thank you so much, Livio, for Livio for giving us so much uh, food for thought in this uh, your initial remarks. Uh, let's turn now to the rest of the panelists to get into some of the most specific discussions on the issues that the report and others raised. Uh, let's first talk about the observed change patterns of capital flows to the region since the global financial crisis. Uh, the report uh, confirming previous finding um, identifies the significant decline in cross-border lending from global banks and the sharp increase in market-based finance, um, namely portfolio flows. There is, of course, also the presence, the increased presence of South-South finance, including the activities of China in the region and the activities of large Latin American banks in other Latin American countries. For example, the importance of Colombian banks in Central America. Uh, Luis, let me start with you. In terms of international sources of financing, what are your views on the role of China in Latin America? Does the impact of China financing flows to Latin America differ from those in other emerging markets? So, uh, thanks, uh, Liliana. Thanks uh, for the invitation to this uh, to this event. I would say that China is clearly becoming more important as a source of financing, but it is still very different from the, the traditional sources. So, uh, you know, to come up with a number is actually very difficult because uh, it is still quite heavily concentrated on a few countries. You know, the, the previous, you know, Alba Group, which keeps, of course, morphing and changing, you know, received you know brunt of the of the inflows, and a lot of this money was actually bilateral debt. Or you know uh, uh, Chinese you know policy banks lending to uh, for, for domestic uh, projects. Uh, you know the, the countries that are more that have access to to markets. You know did not need this type of financing and never uh, look for it. You know the key thing is that Chinese money, strictly speaking, is not concessional money. It's not cheap either. So for those countries that have market access, companies that have market access, they prefer to go to the market and not to knock the door on China. Now that can change, obviously, uh, uh, in the future. Certainly, there's such a political angle to this. You know, the, the uh, China trying to 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 have a stronger presence in Latin America. Latin America is attractive because it is a supplier of commodities that, that China is thirsty for, and we have seen that in Africa in a big way. But I would say that still, even though it is growing, it is still contained. Portfolio inflows are that, that China is not a source of portfolio inflows into Latin America or into emerging markets, broadly speaking, at this stage. It is mostly 
bilateral and uh, policy bank uh, uh, lending uh, to the region. Thank you, Luis. Um, uh, Gerardo, albeit with significant volatility, capital flows to Latin America remain strong in the post-global financial uh, crisis period and before the pandemic, and during the pandemic too, after the sharp uh, decline in early 2020. Um, as the report outlines, there are huge differences between countries, but what do you think has been the most important factor driving the sustainability of, of inflows to Latin America? Better macroeconomic fundamentals like the pool factors or the so-called search for yield motivated by the loose monetary policy in advanced economy, namely push factors combined with the greater participation of investment fund managers. What are your views on this? I think it's both of what you said. So uh, thinking of push factors, I think the unconventional monetary policy in advanced economies having ample global liquidity and also a low interest rate environment for a few years drove the search for yield uh, to our economies. Uh, we saw an increase in foreign direct investment in bank flows and obviously portfolio flows. And in fact, uh, regarding portfolio flows, foreign holdings of emerging market debt in many emerging uh, markets peaked between 2013 and 2017 after the global financial crisis. And I think it has a lot to do with these unconventional, uh, unconventional monetary policies. Uh, thinking of pull factors, as you said, I think economic growth became uh, the most important factor and allowed investors to differentiate on whether to invest in one country or the other. Those with better growth prospects were the largest recipients of foreign capital and those with weaker fundamentals saw uh, more outflows, for example, during uh, the early 2020, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. Now, structural factors became less important uh, in part because of what Livio raised. Uh, there's a general perception that emerging markets have stronger institutions and the feeling that many emer emerging markets have reached a threshold of institutional strength that investors feel comfortable with. Uh, so uh, as he said, uh, emerging markets have graduated in some sense, although I would be cautious on, on saying that for all emerging market uh, economies, and from a financial perspective, you didn't touch upon this, but I think it's also an important point. Diversification benefits to global investors is also attractive uh, for them to invest in emerging market economies. Now, an important aspect is that pipes do have changed. Uh, domestic markets have developed uh, both FX and fixed income and local currency issuance has increased. And uh, in terms of participants, obviously uh, foreign investors and these non-bank financial intermediaries have a, a larger role now. Global asset uh, managers have become uh, much more active in our region in that time. Uh, and this uh, obviously poses some risk that I think that we are gonna address uh, later on. Uh, two more aspects on this uh, pipe uh, aspect of, of flows, which is the growing role of indexed investments. So whenever a country comes into an index, they see large inflows into the country. But when a country exits the index, then the opposite happens. So, so this is obviously uh, amplified the positive and negative capital outflows and uh, increases the sensitivity of these countries to, to global aspects uh, or to global finance. Uh, and the other one is credit ratings. And obviously uh, global investors have also become very sensitive and they have some of them a mechanistic approach to uh, credit ratings. So whenever there's a change you can see either large inflows or large outflows. So, so I would say these are the, the most important drivers, both push, pull and pipes have had a, a large role in what we have been seeing in Latin America in the last few years. Thank you very much, Gerardo. Well, so certainly a much more complex landscape of flows and the uh, structure through which they operate, move and interact. Um, but these observed patterns have been possible due to the process of capital account liberalization that took place in the region since the uh, 90s. Jose, in spite of the drastic swings in inflows to the region, especially during time of acute stress, such as the global financial crisis, the temper tantrum in 2013, and the COVID-19 drive up in um, uh, early 2020. Do you perceive that capital account liberalization has brought 
net gains to Latin America uh, is, play, is, is playing on this, please. Yeah, well, thanks very much for the invitation to this quite interesting and relevant panel. It's, uh, it's of course an issue that comes from time to time and we have to revisit and to learn more about new experiences. The report is very fair in terms of pointing out the benefits, the net benefits in terms of increased investment, in terms of better allocation of resources and risk sharing, but also there are, there are risks. Now, as, as you pointed out, uh, one of the main risks of, of the, the, the capital account dollarization is that you are exposed to sudden stops. And sudden stops, we have the experience, they, they can be very damaging for the economies. However, since the global financial crisis, then tapered tantrum, and then the COVID crisis, what we have seen is a strong period, short period of sudden stops, but without the traditional consequences that emerging market experienced before. And this is extremely good news. So we have, and the report shows that there are sudden stops as frequent as in other periods, but the impact of sudden stop much more, much more moderate. Indeed, the response, or the policy response to the global financial crisis, to the COVID crisis, have been the traditional, as Livio said, the, the advanced economies type of response. A large interest rate cuts, and which is a contrary that we used to do in the past when we faced sudden stops, because when there was sudden stops, with the fear of floating, countries tend to hike interest rate to, to, to prevent a, a capital outflows, perhaps sometimes introducing capital controls on outflows, and nothing of that was needed. And, and, and so that, that shows that one of the main uh, risks and, and problems with capital account liberalization are no for the time being. <laughs> it's, it's not forever, but for the time being, they haven't been as uh, uh, damaging and as in the past, and, and indeed they have had serious uh, effects. And, and this is this is a because because policy frameworks and financial system are much more robust and allow central banks to follow the adequate policies instead of leaning against the wind with a with a strong tightening. I would like to to emphasize anyway, one thing that should be mentioned, and, and perhaps we need more research or, or more organized research on this, and that part of also is institutional strength, as the previous speakers have said, and, and Livio said, there is much more quality, better quality of institutions, financial system, regulation, were much more a, 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 a subject to policies and framework, much, much better design. Now, Exchange rate flexibility. I think that, that, that that's quite a, an important thing. We do not have fear of floating. We have seen a, 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 that exchange rate has been, have been allowed to float with some exchange rate intervention sometimes, also with the provision of liquidity by central banks in order to avoid that the payment system keeps working. But the, 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 in contrary, perhaps to the Asian crisis, for example, uh, 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 th there was much more willingness to let the chain rate to play a role of shocks of absorbers. And, and, and that I think that also has contributed a lot to mitigate the cost of sudden stop. So overall, I would say the, 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 we are able to enjoy the benefits without having tremendous costs. The only cause that I would like also to mention that also the report uh, 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 refers a little bit less, but this is surges in capital inflow. This also poses pose some tensions in economies. When you liberalize many times and you're a strong economy, you have a lot of, of, of push factors that make economies to, to have surges. My impression is that surges are as frequent as sandstorm around the world but across countries, these are very rare episodes. Sudden stops we may have every five, 10 years according to the international conditions. However, surges are sort of once and for all in countries and you have to 
deal with them sometimes with transitory policies, but overall they haven't also been a, 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 a serious problem with the, for the economies. And, and all the things that we thought about sudden stops, contagion, and, and, and currency mismatches and all of that has not been present since the global financial crisis in emerging market economies, and that's a very good news, very good development. Thank you, uh, Pepo, and uh, thank you for bringing the issue of, of exchange rate flexibility. I knew we had we could count on you to raise those issues. I mean, it wouldn't be you without mentioning the advantage of flexible exchange rate regimes. But you also mentioned capital controls and uh, as an issue. And Laura, um, you have deeply studied capital controls. And capital constraints have extensively been used in the region, uh, including by large countries such as Brazil and Argentina. Do you see any advantage in the use of these instruments under what circumstances? And moreover, do you agree with the IMF recommendation that countries susceptible to sudden stops in capital inflows um, should use precautionary capital controls on inflows? when you apply those uh, controls before a, a shock hit. So can they actually lower the risk of, to financial stability? Uh, thanks for the invitation to, to this panel. And, and let me congratulate the, the researchers in the committee. It's a very thoughtful and, and careful document. L let me answer your question with some of the positive facts that this document presents and also some views that they collected from interviews and surveys. Again, I, I was very impressed the different methodologies used in the report. So in graph 4.1, talking about macroprudential, eh, there seems to be overall a positive view on their effectiveness, but the report also notices that they may have fostered a movement towards more volatile capital flows. I think away from banks, more volatile. In some related research, I have also documented that they're increasingly being intermediated by tax heaven um, financial centers. For example, the US, the main holder of assets and liabilities of the US is Cayman Islands. Uh, just to give you a sense of this movement of non-bank and, and tax havens. Graph 4.1 documents that there is not a very good view on the effectiveness of capital controls. If anything, I would say that most policymakers and, uh, and the folks interviewed do not think that capital controls are effective. And there is this very nice quote that says that policymakers and academics recognize that capital controls are more powerful in models than in reality, and that they lack this um, uh, and that their use may reveal some stigma and signal future bad policies. And so in fact, in work that I have been doing with Andres Fernandez and, and Miguel Acosta from the Chilean Central Bank, other than Argentina and some countries, they have not been as used as is commonly thought. The document also uh, mentions that a sound financial system does give you this resilience. None of the models that we tend to use have interactions with the financial system. They all tend to take it as given. And most of them tend to think of bonds. They don't think about equity. They don't think of financial hedging. And so I think that there is this view that is emerging that it's fine if you use them, but for sure they're not the panacea. I will second Jose de Gregorio, and the document also mentions the case of Mexico, the combination of inflation targeting and flexible exchange rate has worked in certain countries. So, so I think that perhaps we're, it was fine uh, to allow countries to use it, but now we're seeing that it doesn't necessarily foster a better allocation of capital and countries do need to do the hard work in terms of the fundamental. So again, I, I think we're coming good, uh, full circle and it's important to have it as a tool, but to recognize that we still need to do the hard work and working in some other uh, parts of the system. So can we read from that, that you are not so happy with the IMF recommendation? 
I, I, if, if you want a more direct answer, I would say I am not. I also do worry that there is this movement of telling countries fix the exchange rate and kill your reserves as opposed to let the exchange rate move and allow some movement. Uh, in bad times, certain things are going to happen uh, in good times as well. But if we have a resilient banking system and a resilient a corporate sector, I think th the system have taken. And again, I mentioned the case of Chile and Brazil, they have fostered also the hedging markets, the financial hedging, and that has also bring, uh, brought uh, resilience to, to some of these uh, trends. Okay, thanks, Laura. So, okay, so far, what we've heard is kind of a brighter picture for the region. That's kind of the assessment that we are getting. But let's now talk, focus a bit on the risks because you have all mentioned that there are risks too on, uh, associated with those flows. So since there are multiple risks, I'm going to be asking um, the different panelists different risks associated with different countries. So let me start with Pepo. Um, a significant uh, proportion of external debt in Chile is corporate debt. And mm -hmm. most of it's denominated in US dollars. And there has been voices alerting about risk arising from potentially unhedged exposures. To what extent are these concerns uh, valid in Chile? First of all, I have to clarify the public that I'm Jose, but also for the friends and people when you get confused and said to people and everybody say, well, who's people? That's me. I was thinking about that. I was not sure whether to call but you Jose is, all the time, but it's so strange to call you Jose. You're a paper for the world. <laughs> so let me let me tell you first a, a, a broader view. I just finished a paper with a colleague look, looking at a firm at a firm level in emerging markets, the issue of borrowing externally. And this may be dangerous when firms borrow to take advantage of carry trade and they take a, a, a open position in, in foreign exchange and they become more vulnerable. And when they don't borrow exactly to do their own business. What we have seen, and, and, and we have seen it there is that most firms and that, that borrow abroad, they, they use the proceeds to invest in the future. So, so there is a, 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 a it is the purpose of, of borrowing for non-financial non corporations. And the second thing is that there is no evidence of, 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 of mismatches, currency mismatches. Now let's go to, to, to the Chilean case and, and to the recent experience. We have had enormous exchange rate fluctuations in the last 15 years, I would say the, the, the last 15, yeah, may have gone from 500 a, 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 a pesos per dollar to 800 and there has been no signs of financial turmoil uh, at all so i would say the the uh, I, I would say it's a, it's a there is always a risk of having debt especially slow down and things like that there was a lot of support for credit in all emerging markets uh, uh, during the crisis uh, th this crisis was interesting because contrary to previous crises, credit expanded during the peak of the crisis and did not contract. And there was a lot of fiscal support and, and guarantees that, that were provided. But at the end, what we see, of course, in a, in a world of very low growth, you will see some uh, financial deterioration, but overall, I think that the, 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 the borrowing has been quite sound. And, the, I would say the, the simple demonstration is global financial crisis, taper tantrum, and, and, and the recent COVID crisis, and non-financial crisis, and the corporate sector, uh, uh, the non-financial corporate sector has performed relatively well, given the circumstances. Thank you, uh, Pepo. Um, Laura. And also now a clarification for the world, she's really Laura. <laughs> but it's Laura in English, right? So it's often argued that a reason why Brazil uh, has been able to maintain high ratios of uh, government debt to GDP, 
without the eruption of a crisis is because a significant proportion of the debt is domestic and held by uh, local banks. Two questions. Uh, first, do you agree with that statement? And second, more generally, how important is who holds the debt, namely local versus foreigners? So thanks. So, so I think here, again, that there are two, two issues. One is the level of debt, and then another one, the composition, which includes the currency, the maturity, and, and who holds the debt. I, I think that, that in the second one, I think Brazil has done a has improved a lot. As you mentioned, there has been a deepening of the local market in terms of currency composition. Most of the local government debt is um, in, in local currency. Uh, some of the uh, firm debt, it is in, in, in foreign, it's mostly dollars. But again, in the case of Brazil, as in the case of Chile, they have a very active hedging uh, financial uh, market and so on. There are no concerns in general, both in government and, and in the private sector of currency mismatches. So at the end, the issue becomes the level. And, and I do think the fact that the composition is, is local and held domestically has helped Brazil, but the level starts to become an issue. Um, and here, I think it's important for Brazil to respect the fiscal rule. Th there is a moment that uh, countries tend to enact these fiscal rules because they know themselves. Uh, they know their weaknesses in good times, their weaknesses in bad times. And I think COVID was a shock that reasonably did require, does require transitional spending, but they do need to pay attention to the medium and long-term sustainability. And, and I think staying within the fiscal rule, I think is, is, is key. Some of the concerns, more than the composition, I think have been related to concerns that the country may not speak to the fiscal rule. And here again, I think the IMF has no help because they have been pushing countries to spend beyond what is uh, required and needed. But to your precise question, I do think the fact that they have fostered domestic markets and a lot is domestic held has helped uh, the country. Thank you. So we talk about uh, Chile, um, Brazil. Let's talk a little bit about some recent Mexico. Uh, Gerardo, uh, data shows that there is a significant participant of foreigners in the local currency bond market in, in Latin America in general. But in Mexico in particular, foreigners held about a quarter of peso denominated sovereign debt, at least before the COVID uh, crisis, perhaps somewhat less now, but it still is uh, important. At the same time, local banks also hold this time of debt. Um, although there is, of course, a strong recognition about the advantage of issuing debt denominated in local currency, and Livio make a um, reference to this, uh, there are also concerns about the risk associated with the nexus between sovereign risk and bank risk. Specifically, the concern is that if for any reason, being it global or being it idiosyncratic, uh, if there is a sell-off of um, of these bonds by foreigners, in that case, there's going to be a resulting decline in the value of these bonds. And that is going to impact adversely on the balance sheet of banks. What are your view on this issue? Okay, so so uh, my, my first reaction to your question would be that we need to have a balanced approach towards the participation of foreign investors in our countries, uh, emerging markets and Mexico. And this balanced approach is recognizing that the foreign investors have also had a, a positive impact in our market. So foreign investors, for in, instance, uh, contribute to the development of our markets, diversified investor base. They also provide liquidity. And in doing so, they reduce the cost of funding, not only in Mexico, but as I mentioned, in many other countries. Now, it is true that these foreign investors have become very important market players, and some of them have become very large in size, and some of them can have uh, systemic implications. For instance, these large asset managers or investment funds also tend to be more procyclical, as you raised, uh, prone to hurt behavior, and many of them trade uh, via some uh, mechanisms that are not that common like algorithms, high frequency, electronic platforms, and that raises liquidity risk. Uh, in the case of Mexico, uh, these uh, foreign investors hold at the beginning of the crisis 29% of uh, 
uh, our government bonds. And now they hold 19% of the government bonds. So uh, as you said, this uh, reduction is significant and it's already taking a toll on the liquidity and the depth of our markets. So from a policy perspective, uh, you can, you can uh, do uh, many things. You can supervise and regulate as, as uh, the global uh, financial authorities are doing so, like the Financial Stability Board, the BIS committees are already uh, carefully analyzing how to address this risk posed by foreign investors and non-bank financial institutions in some of the markets. Uh, and now in terms of Mexico, uh, you, you can also have different responses. So one is uh, to have temporary policy to mitigate the risk that you have already raised in terms of foreign investors. And you can have macro prudential policies or you can also have capital flow management measures put in place, or you can think of these foreign investors, as I mentioned, in a structural way, and then think also of a structural response. And this structural re response consists in the promoting the resiliency of financial markets, strengthening the domestic investor base. Banks is one, as you mentioned, banks can be affected, but banks' balance sheets at this point in Mexico are quite solid. So I wouldn't uh, be uh, too, too concerned at this point uh, because of this uh, changes in valuations of, of, of uh, government bonds. And the other thing that you can do also structurally is on how uh, strengthening this domestic ba uh, domestic investor base is, for example, through pension reform. And as you know, uh, Mexico just last year approved a, a pension reform that uh, I think in the future will, uh, will be very valuable in terms of maybe also strengthening the domestic base, but also taking into consideration the fact that foreign investors are probably more volatile and are more fragile going forward into a scenario in which advanced economies might uh, withdraw gradually the monetary uh, stimulus that they have provided to the market. Um, so, so I'll stop here. Thank you, Gerardo. Um, Luis, we've been relegating you for a long time now, but not anymore. You've heard the different risks that uh, people have been raising, uh, the panelists in different countries. Uh, from the market perspective, what other type of risk do you see in the characteristics of Latin American debt? So one thing to, I, I, I wanna echo some of the, the, the good things that happened over the past year and a half, which is, you know, the, and this is one of the conclusions I think of the paper, uh, which is uh, emerging markets did gain credibility in terms of being able to react and respond to a shock like COVID, mimicking many of the developed market policies without generating a market panic. I have to admit that when the initial phase of COVID was uh, uh, you know, uh, going on and we started to see emerging market central banks cutting rates and some of them talking about engaging in quantitative easing, we were extremely nervous because we didn't know how investors would react to this, right? Uh, this was a completely uh, new policy uh, uh, response, a policy reaction. And, uh, and we were very surprised how, you know, in general, how well uh, digested was uh, this policy response by the market, right? No one panicked. Of course, currencies depreciated, but for a good reason. And, uh, and people already mentioned, right? It was good that, em that emerging markets uh, uh, central banks or in general authorities were able and willing to let currencies do the adjustment, absorb part of the shock. Uh, very little of that translated in the initial phase into inflation. And central banks were able to continue cutting rates, uh, and most of them did actually last year. This year, and uh, there was a sudden stop of capital to speak of in terms of we, we did see outflows, uh, but the outflows, you know, we, we, we account, uh, we keep track of portfolio flows, and portfolio flows clearly went down on the back of COVID but they started to recover at some point in the middle of the year. By the end of the year, everything that went out, which was 40 billion plus, according to our accounting, was reversed. So actually emerging markets, fixed income, bond markets ended up with positive flows at the end of last year. This year, uh, the picture is still a supporting one. Uh, you know, We have 53 billion of inflows into bond, uh, bond funds. There's another 100 billion into EM equities, which is good news. But I want to highlight you know, some of the risks here that are in a way masked in this type of aggregates, which is the currency composition of these inflows. People are very concerned, investors are concerned about putting money, piling money into local currency uh, uh, bonds uh, uh, these days. If you look at these 20, uh, 53 billion of inflows year to date that I'm mentioning, the, the, the portion that corresponds to hard currency bonds is uh, 27 billion. 
the remainder uh, of 25 billion is local currency, of which China is almost 10 billion, <laughs> sorry, 20 billion. So what is left, which is around 3.2 billion, that's the only magnitude of inflows into EM local markets. And when we get to Latin America, the only two countries that have seen inflows into their local bond markets from foreigners here to date are Brazil and Colombia. And this is because the yields are attractive. We're still in a search for yield environment at the end of the day. But Chile, Peru, Mexico uh, um, have seen uh, 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 cumulative uh, outflows here to date. On the back of that, and of course, the pandemic forced many countries to issue, uh, I mean, to run large fiscal deficits, a lot of fiscal stimulus. That is continuing this year, that would likely continue next year. And what we have seen, the way in which governments have financed that is to issue more external debt. So in a way, Latin America and many EM countries around the world are reversing. I mean, they, they, they had started to overcome the original sin, right, uh, of uh, issuing in a foreign currency, issuing more uh, in local currency. But that trend clearly stopped last year. This year, I think that when I look at the numbers of how much hard currency issues there have been, you know, like uh, Chile year to date is 13.5 billion. Last year, Mexico did 16.3. This year is like 10 billion year to date. Uh, and there's more in the pipeline. For sure, the metrics of how much is foreign, how much is local currency is going to move in, 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 uh, in the direction of hard currency. So that obviously is going to be planting the seed for vulnerabilities down the road. Uh, it is not, I mean, maybe the numbers are still modest, I don't know, three, five percent of GDP uh, in, in several cases, but that, that is something to watch, right? And then when you see things happening, you know, uh, in Chile or in my own country, in Peru, our country, uh, of these pension fund withdrawals that are being authorized, you know, which is the, the biggest source of demand for local currency debt, well, you know that uh, the governments are going to be forced to issue more external debt because who's going to be buying the local bonds, right? Foreigners are shunning it. And there's local, the, the power, uh, purchasing power of the local investor base is, uh, is shrinking. Thank you, Luis. That was a tour de force on, the, on issuance. And the, well, it kind of uh, uh, put down a little bit the, the kind of uh, good atmosphere that we were having in terms of how good Latin America is doing, which brings me to uh, the last part of our discussion, which on purpose I left to the, uh, to the end of the session, but it's something that our audience is certainly expecting to hear from, from all of you, and is whether Latin America is ready to face a potential increase in inter an eventual, I would say, increase in interest rates uh, by the US Fed. So um, let me go again to you, Luis. Because the first question I like to know, to put things in context, is given the news about inflation and inflation expectations in the United States, what are your views and the market views on the path of normalization of interest rates in the US? So let's frame that, and then we'll have the panelists reacting to what happens in the different countries. So, you know, we're, we're going by the messages that are having espoused by, by Fed uh, officials so far, which is, you know, they're going to start with tapering and tapering will be announced sometime in this fourth quarter. Uh, you don't know, we don't know when it's going to be in uh, November, December, but uh, the temperature will, will, will kickstart. Uh, the first hike in our forecast is still not until the first uh, half of 2023. But uh, our economists admit that there is a, an odd chance that it could actually happen in the second half of next year uh, when we start the Fed uh, uh, hiking. What is interesting, though, is that EM central banks in general, and that includes clearly Latin America, are not waiting for the Fed to start hiking, and they have started to react to their own realities of inflation pressures, and they have started to, to hike uh, uh, already. Thank you. OK, so for. Pepo, Laura, and Gerardo. Keeping in mind that a number of Latin American central banks, as Luis just said, have already started to increase interest rate, partly as a response to increasing expected inflation, how ready is the region to significant increases in interest rate in the US? Going back to the title of this conference, will this time be different for Latin America? Since there are a lot of diversity between countries, uh, I would like you to focus your response on one or a couple of countries. 
So who would like to start? Let me just quickly. Sure. Um, so so uh, as, as Luis mentioned, there's some countries that have a very good pulse of the reality. Brazil is one of those. So Brazil, lower interest rate when it was needed. And they also started to increase interest rate before everyone else. They had a little bit of bad luck in terms of rain and agriculture and probably put more inflationary pressures, but they have a very good uh, sense of the reality. They have a very competent team and they know what they're doing. That's not the case in Costa Rica. Costa Rica priced themselves out of the private market. We've been going to the IMF. Uh, the money has been used uh, to sustain the exchange rate. Nothing has been adjusted. So Costa Rica is, 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 is in no way ready uh, for increases in the interest rates and the government is now in campaign for next year. Uh, so, so that is a country that, uh, again, the, the, it, it's just gonna create more problems from, from the ones that they already have. Regarding, regarding the case of Chile, I have no problem. Chile has, been a deter has experienced a deterioration in the fiscal accounts, but still is far from saying that we'll, be, we'll suffer some vulnerability. Because for me, the main concern with an increase in global interest rates is the fiscal position. And I think that the report by Livio and Gerardo raised an important point, and they said there has been change in composition. And one of the changes in composition is that there is much more borrowing from the governments. And this is a counterpart of a weaker fiscal position that has been accumulated since the global financial crisis. It's quite surprising because countries were quite, quite effective in, in having expansion of fiscal policy, but it happened what I call fiscal inertia. They didn't withdraw the stimulus on time and they became permanent. So what we have now is a permanent deterioration. And of course, a shock in interest rate, it, it could be a very problematic. You can say, well, having 70, 100% debt to GDP at 1%, 2% interest rate is quite different when you have it at four or five or even more. And, and especially when the, the risk premium goes up. So together with the, with the with increasing global free rates. So I think that that's a big problem. In the case of Argentina, it doesn't count in a way because they are not in, in official markets and they have problems, deeper problems than just interest rates. And I think that some, the rest of the region can can kind of struggle. Brazil has very high debt, and, and I think that is it, it will be it will create problems. And the problem also is exacerbated by the fact that there is a lot of social demands overall in the region. The 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 Chile is, a, is kind of the poster child in this. You know, there, there has been a lot of social turmoil and, and protest and people asking for more financing of, of, of social expenditure. And and the space has been reduced. So with lower fiscal, with smaller fiscal space, with higher interest rate, of course, you are in a, in a, in a more risky situation. And uh, let, me, let me share the views uh, about fiscal fragility, which I completely share. I think that's the depressing problem in Latin America. And obviously uh, the fact that we have also some social problems in, in, many, in many countries. And I think it speaks for the fact that as uh, financial authorities and as policymakers, we haven't been able to provide adequate social mobility ladders to the population. And we are seeing um, those problems right now. And it's showing also as fiscal fragility in, in many of our emerging market uh, countries. But let me try to finish uh, this on a, on a more positive aspect, which I also think um, that I would like to share with you because in some ways uh, some uh, emerging market countries are also in better shape like uh, particularly we think from an external account perspective uh, trade balance current account balance uh, the, the fact that some of uh, many countries have also built a large buffer of international reserves that's on the positive side. Another positive side is, is the fact that uh, the policy toolkit in many uh, emerging market economies to address market volatility or market dysfunction is also broader. I think that COVID-19 has also brought with it 
uh, experience to central banks and to financial authorities in providing liquidity, in enhancing credit channels, in conducting asset purchases, in conducting FX intervention. Obviously, also with the knowledge of the pros and cons of each of these policy tools to address volatility. And, uh, and also, let me, let me share uh, a message that I also tried to convey in the previous answer. The best way to be positioned for a taper tantrum or for the Federal Reserve liftoff is to have strong fundamentals, to have prudent macro policy, responsible fiscal policies, external accounts that do not represent pressing vulnerabilities, and financial markets working uh, properly. I think that we want to face this situation that is coming because we know tapering is around the corner and we know that liftoff is coming either in 2022 or 2023. We want to face that, that situation from a position of strength and that position of strength, you can have it only if you think in the long term and having good fundamentals and thinking of the structural side of, of policy. Uh, in regards to taper tantrum, and just to finish with that, I think it's worth noting that central banks in advanced economies have also, uh, or they have conveyed that, that they have learned also an important lesson from the past. And this time around, they have been very, very clear in regards to when the tapering of their asset purchases might begin. That includes obviously the Fed. And they have also clearly separated the fate of these asset purchases from the fate of interest rate increases. So I also am a bit more optimistic about how the market will react to this uh, start of the withdrawal of monetary policy stimulus in advanced economies. I'm more optimistic. That doesn't mean that as emerging market economies, we, we obviously need to be ready to this situation. And I think uh, always keeping a track on the long term and having strong fundamentals is the way to go. Uh, thank you, Gerardo. Certainly, most of you have a very positive uh, view in general. Laura, I was a bit surprised about how positive you are about of Brazil, given the fiscal dominance in that country. Um, I saw Luis rating rating. I, I did say I did say they need to stay in the fiscal book. They they should stay within the fiscal book. Okay, but if they don't, will the central bank be able to have the sufficient tools to offset that not so desirable behavior? The central bank in Brazil right now has an amazing team. I'm sure they're going to be able to do the right thing. <laughs> OK. So, uh, Liliana, if I can just add one last thing. From the market perspective, uh, the reason why the market is pricing more rate hikes pretty much across the board uh, in the, you know, if, if you look at the uh, uh, curves is because even though there's been already some hikes, the policy rate in real terms, when you just simply subtract, uh, you know, the 12-month uh, uh, CPI, it is quite negative still, right? So you have, you know, in the case of Brazil, you know, 4.4% negative, in Chile, 3.3%, Colombia, 2.7%, Mexico is the one that is closer to, you know, neutrality, 1.1%, Peru, 3.9% negative. When the Fed starts to hike a year from now, a year and a half from now, you probably want to be something closer to neutral. Neutral doesn't need to be zero, it's be minus 1%, but to be a minus four, minus three, Sounds like a formula for trouble. So even though we're not talking crisis here, and uh, and to the extent that fiscal policy is going to take time to adjust or to correct, to reduce these imbalances generated by COVID, I think that central banks are going to need to do a lot more of the heavy lifting in preparing their economies for what comes when the Fed hikes. You know, so I see, I, see, I see more hikes across the region as almost inevitable. Yes, and actually I tend to agree with you in the past, many of the deficiencies in the fiscal policies and other policies have been taken over by the heroes of the whole thing, which have been the central banks, right? And I don't see really this time to be so much different than in the past. So, um, so you know, it's hard to end on a completely positive stance. I know that there is uh, this trying to be very positive. Um, I have my doubts, but you know, so we have uh, basically reached the, uh, if anybody wants to raise a final comment or discussion be before we, we end, um, uh, we have passed our time limit, but only for three minutes. So I think we are in good time. So I want to thank you all of you for this absolutely excellent panel, Livio and Gerardo for a wonderful report, Laura, Luis and Pepo for a quite interesting conversation that uh, I don't think we can solve the problems this day, but we let the audience derive their conclusions about are we really positive or not so much. Okay, thank you so much to all and until the next time.
Thank you.